are recorded in the Bible. Lazarus, a man already dead four days, is raised up by Jesus. A person born blind, eyes opened. Another who could not hear or speak, completely restored. Cripples, paralyzed, bedridden, all made whole. Many of these are just more than a healing. These are miraculous. These are impossible situations where people were healed totally without medical help of any kind. The Bible shows clearly that Jesus heals miraculously and he still heals miraculously today. And we need that. There are many things for which medicine has no cure. I must admit though, to me, miracles are somewhat mysterious. We do not really know what releases miracles. They can seem quite random and there is no formula. But we do know miracles happened in the Bible, throughout history, and are still happening today. Jesus heals miraculously today. There was a recent book written and made into a movie called Miracles from Heaven, and it really illustrates what I'm talking about. A young girl who had an incurable disease, she had sought all kinds of medical help, but she has this accident of falling through a tree. She survives, which she shouldn't have done, and then is miraculously healed of her disease after she has this encounter with Jesus. It seemed very serendipitous. The family themselves, while they were Christians, had no real grid for miracles. But I think this should encourage all of us. Jesus is still doing miracles. His love for us compels him. He wants to deliver us from fear and from deadly disease. Jamie shares her story of battling fear and a diagnosis of a deadly disease. Well, my family, um, especially on my mom's side, we have a very strong history of cancer, uh, particularly breast cancer. My mom, at a young age, had a double mastectomy, and my aunt, who I'm very close with, she was diagnosed at a young age of invasive breast cancer. So it's always been on my mind. I don't know if there's a day that goes by that I don't think about it, and it's been not if, but when. Uh, so it was in the summer, I think, of 2014, um, I myself found a mass. Um, we made an appointment to have some scans done, and you know, that's another two weeks or so later, you get in and you get those scans. And this started a process that was several months of different doctor's appointments, uh, different types of doctors, different feedbacks, different scans, and waiting. I consider myself um, a faith-filled person, and I think that most people that know me and even know me well would say that. But to be honest, in this circumstance, faith really wasn't even there. It wasn't that it wasn't there, but it wasn't that it was there. I think I just put it in the back of my mind. I didn't talk about it with really anyone other than my husband and my pastors. Um, I kind of just pretended that it wasn't happening. So the surgeon called, which was unexpected. There were a lot of details that he gave me, um, but basically he said that I would need to have a mastectomy and I would not be a candidate for reconstructive surgery. And I needed to have the surgery probably within a week. All these thoughts came like a freight train through my brain. I didn't even have time to, to process each individual one. And I remember, the biggest thing I remember is a force pushing me backwards against the wall. I was walking backwards in my room and I remember actually smacking my head on the back of the wall because I was being pushed back so heavily. Um, when I hit my, um, when I smacked my head, I just froze and my body just went limp and I laid on the floor. And in that moment, I cried out. And it was the most pure form of God help that I ever experienced. In that moment, I definitely felt God's presence, his real presence, um, his, his actual body was there in front of me and he was looking at me. His face was about a foot away from my face. I was laying on the ground, but he was kneeling 
and he had one knee on the ground and one propped up and he was just looking at me and it was like we were communicating without talking. It is especially difficult to battle fear when there is a history of disease in our family. I think many who have heard a dreaded diagnosis can really identify with Jamie's response. You are emotionally stunned. You're, you're numbed. You, you may cry out as she did, help God. It, it is a pure cry from our heart. And it's important for all of us to know, Jesus hears our cry. I love the story in the Gospel of Mark about the blind beggar. He was not one embarrassed to yell out at Jesus. Mark records this in Mark chapter 10. Then they reached Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man, cheer up, they said, come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. This guy needed a miracle. He was blind. He was a beggar. He hears Jesus coming by and he does not hold back. He screamed louder and louder. He didn't care that others were annoyed or told him to shut up. Jesus heard, called him and Bartimaeus jumps up, throws off his coat and then Jesus asked him an interesting question. What do you want me to do? And he said clearly, I want to see. Do not hold back. Tell Jesus exactly what you want. Be honest, cry out for his mercy. This is faith in action. Jamie discovered an amazing answer to her prayer for help, a fresh empowerment from the presence of Jesus and his Holy Spirit. So after um, composing myself, uh, I felt um, empowered that I have decisions to make. Um, I may not have the power for everything, but I have the power to pray. I have the power to read my Bible. I have the power to talk to my pastors. I have power to do these things. And so I read the Bible and the scriptures just, they meant so many different things. It was all new all over again. Um, and so I called the doctor back and I, and I told him that I, wanted some time to think about it. I needed to pray, I needed to talk to some people. And, and his response was, don't wait more than a week. So Kevin, my husband and I, I remember sitting at the table and we just did as much research on different hospitals as we could. We both felt strongly that we should have this done maybe at a bigger hospital. And I love how God placed that on my heart and placed it on his heart. So to me, it was just affirmation that this was God's nudging because we were together in unison over that. So we decided um, to call Mayo Clinic and we did. We explained what was going on and they got me in, I think it was that week, uh, we got into our consultation. When you are dealing with the disruption of a scary diagnosis, it affects your marriage. This can help or it can hinder, but it truly affects your marriage. A strong, healthy marriage is so important. And I love how Kevin and Jamie partnered during her tough battle. Of course, it was not easy. There were lots of challenges. They needed one another to help make wise decisions, to be a sounding board, to be extra understanding when things change and emotions are not normal. Jamie and Kevin faced this together. They share this honestly with us. So during this time, um, I kind of felt like my body was my enemy. Um, I didn't like looking in the mirror. 
um, I didn't feel beautiful. And my husband, you know, as a great husband, he wanted to support me and affirm me and give me hugs and put his hand on my shoulder and, and be there for me. And I just, I could not stand him even putting his hand on my shoulder because why would you touch this? Why would you touch this body that's going to take me away from you? And it was difficult every night. I kind of slept on the very edge of the bed because I didn't, I didn't want to be touched. And it's, it's a strain. It was a big strain on, on our marriage, at least for on my part. And he was so supportive, but for me, it was it was difficult. And I don't know if everyone understands what it does to relationships when one person is is maybe sick and the other person is the caregiver. The next week, uh, we went, we arranged everything, and we went to Mayo Clinic. The first thing that we did is we met with a doctor that was going to oversee basically my case from start to finish. So she said, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to recreate all the scans that you had. We're going to make our own scans here and start from the beginning. So I went immediately that same day to the first uh, series of tests. Um, so she's doing the scans as we're talking, and she becomes very quiet, where she was talking a lot, and, all, and now she's completely quiet. And it, it worried me. And you know, you get that, is everything okay? And she says, I'm going to go get one of your doctors, and I'll be back. And so they both come over and they look at me and they say, we have something to tell you. And I'm prepared for the worst. And she says, we cannot duplicate what they found back home. What does that mean? <laughs> you know? And she said, oh, I can tell where the tumor was, but what I'm seeing is perfectly healthy tissue now. And she was explaining, she just was talking and said, I have to put something on your chart and I am just going to put that I find no abnormalities in your scans and I am going to put that your other scans must have indicated an awkward shadow. That's what she told me. But she said, I'm telling you, it was not a shadow and you have your mass is no longer there and you have perfect tissue. She said, but I can't put that in your chart. And she leaves. And when she left, then the technician, who, you know, we had kind of chatted earlier, so she was a little more laid back. Then she was ecstatic. And she says, I wanted to tell you, but I had to wait for the doctor, but it was, I've never seen anything like this. She pulled a chair and sat next to me, and she looked at me, and she said, you are at Mayo Clinic. We are the best of the best. And she said, I have been doing this for more than a decade, and I have never seen this before. Wow, miracles do happen. It is especially exciting when a top medical expert who has seen and dealt with thousands of cases can say, I've never seen this, and God bless you. <laughs> yes, medical proof is helpful, and doctors often do find it hard to admit. Their worldview is often not supernatural. It's rational, scientific, and it excludes the possibility of miracles. But Jesus does heal today and he does miracles. I think it is so beautiful how our intimacy with Jesus and his great love for each one of us is highlighted in Jamie's experience. Jesus's visitation in her room was exceptional, but he knew she needed it and she responded to this power encounter. She read her Bible, she prayed, she felt empowered to trust in a fresh way and make decisions. It was only as she looked back did she understand fully. So yes, I believe that Jesus heals today. And I had the opportunity then after all of this to finally breathe and reflect and when I did that, I knew that the moment in that bedroom, the moment that Jesus appeared, that the spirit of fear had to flee. And I knew in that moment, he touched me. And when I prayed after Mayo Clinic, when I prayed to Jesus about the circumstances, he told me, I healed you right in that moment. If you need a miracle, 
Do not grow discouraged. Continue to love Jesus. Listen to him. Respond as he directs. He may surprise you, or he may continue to gently lead you. But do know he loves you deeply and wants you well.